Okay, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce this panel. Uh, actually, our format's going to be kind of a hybrid. We're going to do some sort of messaging on what RISC-V International's been doing, especially the cryptographic extensions groups. And then we're going to switch to kind of a more traditional panel format where we ask questions. We take questions from you or from us with whatever time is left after we get done with the prepared material. Okay, and so, um, uh, let me uh, introduce our panelists. Uh, myself, Richard Newell, I work in microchip technology, uh, but I've been uh, involved in uh, RISC-V Foundation, RISC-V International, since actually the first day the RISC-V Foundation existed. Uh, I've been either chair or vice chair of a, of a, a security committee uh, for you know nine years or whatever that's been. Um, uh, let me jump to Andrew, who's uh, kind of my boss in Risk Five. He's uh, he runs the uh, Horizontal Security Committee, um, and uh, he's a consultant in his day job, and uh, and has a, a quite a quite a structure security committees that we're gonna he's gonna talk about here in a minute. Um, this is uh, Graham Hickey, who's uh, from PQ Shield. So many of you probably know them, or at least you know some of their cryptographers, because uh, they've been very, very involved in um, the uh, post-quantum stuff, uh, contributing to Falcon and Raccoon, and I don't know what all, a lot of, a lot of the uh, standards and proposed uh, standards for post-quantum, and, uh, and they've also been contributing on the RISC-V activity, so uh, uh, one of their engineers basically wrote the scalar crypto spec, and, uh, Another one basically wrote our entropy source spec, so they've been uh, big contributors uh, to our committee. And finally, I have uh, Nicola Bruni uh, from uh, Sci5 in his day job, but he's also been working on the cryptography extensions, you know, attending weekly for year after year, and uh, kind of our secretary. Uh, so we're very thankful to him for all the work that uh, he's put into. Okay, so I'm gonna, probably going too slow here. Uh, Typical disclaimer, right? and then uh, this is the order we're going to go th through. I just did the introduction. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, Andrew, who's going to talk about the RISC-V uh, structure, and then it's going to come back to me. I'm going to talk about some of the things we did in the past, some of the things we're working on in the future. Uh, Nicola is going to uh, dive a little deeper into the post-quantum stuff, and then Graham's going to talk about real-world issues and industrial issues. and and uh, uses uh, and such. Okay, so uh, with that. Thanks, Richard. Um, so the presentation is gonna start off fairly high level, not that technical. And as it gets more and more technical, we'll see how many people get up and leave. Um, and then it becomes less technical again towards the end. Um, so what is RISC-V, first of all? Who is familiar or who isn't familiar with RISC-V? Is there anybody here who knows, has no idea what RISC-V is? Looks like everybody is, that's good. So it's the open source instruction set architecture. Um, I chair the security committee, um, which is responsible for trying to leverage the, this unique position that RISC-V is in. So RISC-V is, is, is new, it's clean, open, open source, clean slate, so we can really build on expertise and history without any legacy issues. So we haven't got to worry about um, you know, thumb instructions from 1998 or, or any of these horrible, messy complexities. Um, we can look at all of the um, advances, understandings that have, that have taken place in the past uh, 10, 20 years in, in instruction sets and security, um, and we can build in protections against various forms of attack from the get-go. So we have found, you know, an opportunity for real foundational security in RISC-V. Um, this is across all of the application spaces, from the embedded space, through um, application processes, through to servers, through to high-performance compute, so it's a very broad range of threats and issues that we've, we've got to try and to mitigate against. But fundamentally, they all use pretty much the same set of tools in the toolbox. Um, so if you look at the picture on the right, you can see um, everything across all the application spaces, um, all the use cases and work, workloads. And then we have everything from hardware root of trust at the bottom. That's pretty foundational across all of these. And then we have the hardware security like side channel leakage protection where we're adding things like um, um, uh, side-channel resistant instruction spans, a form of fence instruction. 
Uh, runtime integrity, so control flow integrity, rock and drop attack protection. That's shadow stacks, landing pads, and the like, memory tagging. Um, and then what these other guys will go into a bit more detail, um, cryptographic acceleration extensions. Um, and then we move up into the realms of trusted computing, trusted execution environments. All of these things are being built and specified today within RISC V. And then across the top, pulling it all together is, of course, um, we have the software ecosystem, the firmware, the tools, the compilers, um, and then the governance layer sitting across the very top with um, security incident response team, security model, standards compliance, um, liaison with certification bodies, et cetera. Um, so that's what we're trying to do. This is the really how we're trying to do it. So this is a complex picture. Um, in Risk Five, it's organized with horizontal committees. So the horizontal committee sits across the top and it's trying to um, define the strategy of security for Risk Five. Um, strategy, direction, gap analysis, looking for where are the holes, what should we be worried about. Um, and we're very open and we need the community to tell us what we're missing, what we're forgetting. Um, so if you think, hang on a minute, why haven't they thought of X, why haven't they thought of Y, um, just drop us a message, please. That would be really helpful. Um, and then we have the yellow boxes. These are the special interest groups. These are persistent, um, persistent bodies which look at an area of security um, on the, over the longer term. Um, they don't produce specifications. What they do do is they spawn what we call task groups, and the task groups have a very defined deliverable. So underneath, for instance, the, um, the control for integrity special interest group, we have the shadow stacks and labeled landing pads task group, which is defining an instruction extension um, that defines uh, how, you, how you manage shadow stacks, how you manage labeled landing pads um, on indirect branches to prevent uh, rock and drop attack uh, for control flow integrity. Um, what we're going to come into a bit more detail is this group here. These don't sit under a, uh, under a special interest group. They sit directly under the Security Horizontal Committee because everybody knows we need crypto extensions. Some of these are, are done, some of them are in progress. Um, the document that pulls it all together, if you're new to Risk Five and you want to go and take a look, is the security model. So the security model defines, it's, it's a bit like the recipe book. If all of these are ingredients, then the security model is the recipes for each of the application spaces we talked about before, the embedded application and server space. So that's the how, and this is where we've got to. So this is the current status of the progress, um, updated last week. Largely finished in completion from 2023, um, we have Scalar Crypto, which I think is gonna be spoken about, and Vector Crypto, which was done last year. Shadow stacks and landing pads for rock and drop is, is closing. Pointer masking, which um, allows you to build using software, allows you to build isolated memory spaces. Um, and then SPMP, which is a, um, a version of a physical memory protection table, but it's accessed by a supervisor node that lets you use, um, effectively lets you have different isolated supervisor layers, OSs, et cetera, each with their own physical memory protection table. So they each think they're managing the bare metal when they're not really um, standard techniques. Uh, we also have something called Cove, which is the confidential VM extension. So this is the building block that lets you um, have confidential computing. So it's think ARM realms, think um, Intel SGX, etc. cetera. Um, what we're really working on at the moment um, and making great progress actually is supervisor domain isolation. So this is the memory tracking table. This is how we can really build um, genuine trusted computing, confidential computing on isolation. So this is a, this is a memory filter that sits um, allowing to have different supervisor IDs, different domain IDs, um, each with their own private memory space. IOPMPs, obviously if you're building a system on chip and you've got multiple domain, uh, multiple DMA masters, then you have to have um, the ability to sandbox those as well, otherwise there's easy attacks where um, one domain sorry, one DMA master can go and access another domain's data. High assurance crypto, I won't dwell on these, but these are very interesting. So high assurance and post-quantum, this is what the bulk of today's technical information will be about. Um, Microarchitectural side channel resistance, instruction spans, it's basically a temporal fence. Um, and then the non-ISA informative stuff, the security model I talked about, the recipe book, 
um, and then the COVIO ABI, this is bringing devices into confidential workloads. Um, and starting now, there's a very interesting thing called Cherry. This is Capability Hardware Enhanced Risk Instructions. So this has come out of Cambridge University. Um, it's all about capabilities, where effectively every pointer has a, um, a tag in memory that says what it's allowed for, what, what its privilege level is, what memory space it can actually le legally point into. And you can build um, basically memory safe. You can, take, you can take C code, recompile it, and make it memory safe. So this is quite a revolutionary um, technology. Obviously, it has some, in, some implications about software compatibility in, um, in horizontal ecosystems. In the embedded space in vertical e ecosystems, it's much easier to implement. Um, memory safety, we're working a lot on memory safety. And reference crypto libraries, uh, again, we'll come back to that. Um, and then in the future, we're going to move into the more embedded aspects of lightweight isolation, where we can't afford to have all of the complexity of confidential computing. Uh, so that was a, a whistle-stop tour of RISC-V and security. Um, there'll be opportunity for questions um, at the back end of the talk. But on that note, I will hand it over to Richard. OK. <laughs> Mic's working again. OK, good. Thank you. OK, so I'm just going to go into a, a, like one slide more detail on a couple of things on, on Andrew's uh, last slide. Uh, first, there are the things that we, you know, have already kind of closed. Uh, we, we call the first group of specs uh, scalar cryptography because they run on, you know, a, a regular scalar CPU as opposed to a vector uh, CPU. These are very, very lightweight uh, instructions, kind of uh, broke, you know, for example, AES is broken into several operations and there's an instruction to do to, to, an S box, there's an instruction to you know do a rotate or, or whatever. So they're they're very uh, small, uh, you know, bite-sized instructions, and that together with the software you can you know you can accelerate uh, uh, AES or or SHA four, uh, SHA two, SHA three, uh, SM three, SM four, uh, or um, uh, you know G hash because there's a carryless multiplier and there's various uh, bit manipulations. Uh, there were added, there were already, of course, some bit manipulation instructions in RISC-V, uh, but we you know, went through all the crypto algorithms and we decided that a few were missing and we added those uh, as well. And uh, the um, an another uh, spec that we put out was uh, for timing side channel protection. So that's um, that's here. So uh, we say side channel protection here, we're talking really about uh, timing only. Uh, so there's a, a spec uh, which um, uh, guarantees a list of instructions which are uh, have data independent timing. Okay, because uh, uh, unlike, uh, let's say, uh, the x86 architecture is pretty well controlled just by, you know, Intel and, uh, uh, you know, ARM has fixed uh, CPU sets. Uh, in, in the RISC-V world, we have hundreds of people making different CPUs uh, all to the same instruction set. And, uh, so, and so we thought it was uh, best to guarantee the, uh, that, that if they claim timing independence, they have to, they have to guarantee this list of instructions is, uh, has got data independent timing, or more colloquially, we call it constant time. Uh, but they don't actually have to be constant time. They just have to be independent of the, uh, of the data being processed. And then um, the, uh, whoop, the, uh, another uh, important, they did it again. Uh, another important spec we have is uh, entropy source. So uh, we don't say how the entropy is to be generated. You know, it could be ring oscillators. It could be, you know, metastability. It could be any number of ways. Uh, but we put a common interface on gathering the entropy into the software. So it's the interface between the hardware and the software. There's a, there's a couple of instructions that say, uh, it, here's, how you, here's how you pick up entropy from uh, the hardware, and that can be, this, that can be the same across uh, you know, all the uh, uh, different people building CPUs then. So these are highly configurable. Uh, and you can see that they're put in groups. So if you only want to do NIST algorithms, you could select one group. If you only want to do Chinese algorithms, you could 
select another group. If you don't want to do the random uh, bits, fine. You know, so, so you can uh, pick and choose uh, amongst all of these. Of course, that creates a lot of flexibility, but, uh, but it also uh, can you know, cr create some fracturing in the ecosystem. And so RISC-V has this idea of, uh, of uh, uh, platforms where they specify a collection of standards which uh, uh, are kind of expected to go together in, in certain classes of systems. Okay. okay, so that was the scalar instruction and we did uh, also a vector instruction set. So this is, um, uh, you know, based on the vector, vector registers, long registers, uh, we came up with a uh, new concept called element groups, uh, which you can think of as like super elements. Uh, so if you have a 64-bit vector processor and most of your elements are 64 bits or less, but we, we make elements that are 256 bits or 128 bits or even 512 bits long by, by collecting a bunch of 64-bit elements together into a group. And so it's kind of a, a, a new concept of, uh, of this uh, element groups. And uh, of course, a lot of these vector CPUs would typically have registers that are 512 or 1,024 bits or even longer. And so you can, you can you know, vectorize AES, for instance, with 128-bit messages. If you had a 1,024-bit you know, register, you could, you could vectorize, you know, do eight uh, element groups at once. Um, with, that is to say with one opcode. How it's sequenced under the hood is up to the implementer, right? Uh, and, uh, so we did um, instructions again for AES, SHA-2, uh, SM-3, and SM-4, uh, some vector uh, bit manipulation instructions that we thought were missing, and uh, carryless multiplier, but also a specific uh, field equation for G-hash. So we have the uh, G-hash polynomial you know, reduction built into the carryless multiplier as well. Okay, uh, so you can do the G hash and the one, one op code. And, and just like with the scalar, uh, we also have the uh, guaranteed list of um, instructions which have to be uh, timing safe. Uh, and these can be put together into uh, profiles. And, you know, and so uh, a good many of these things would be included in the RVA 23 profile, which might be aimed at uh, you know, higher end uh, CPUs like in uh, you know servers and, uh, and and cloud services and things like that. Okay, uh, so that's what has been done. Uh, now we're going to talk about what we're currently working on, and uh, one uh, one area is uh, we're calling it high assurance cryptography. Okay, so high assurance means a lot of different things to different people. Uh, what we're talking about here. Are, are these two things, better key management and full rounds AES instructions. The purpose of the full rounds AES instructions is it uh, lets you uh, build mask and countermeasures uh, inside that instruction. So, uh, so that's what we mean by high assurance. We don't, mean, we don't mean formal analysis. We don't mean red-black separation. Like I said, uh, high assurance can mean a lot of different things. Those are sort of orthogonal subjects, and you could do those or not do those, uh, but what the task group is working on are, are these two areas. So the better key management uh, basically is protect the keys from, uh, from software, so software can't see the keys, and the keys are moved uh, by uh, using handles and not by moving the plain text keys themselves. Uh, and there's, there's uh, provisions for encrypting the keys and you know, if they get swapped out to, to uh, DDR memory or to a, a flash memory or di you know, flash disk, then you can bring the encrypted key back in and, and get a handle for it again so you can, you can use that key. But the, the, uh, you know, after it's enrolled, nobody ever sees the key. So the key is protected inside the hardware. And the, uh, the second part is uh, full, full rounds AES instructions. Like I said, the purpose here is to allow uh, side channel countermeasures. Here I'm talking about monitoring side channels like uh, DPA and uh, you know differential EMA and uh, uh, things like that. Because the issue with the uh, vector uh, AES, the one that we are, oh, excuse me, the one we already ratified, 
is it does round by round. So one instruction does one round of, of AES. Uh, this is what x86 is what ARM does. Uh, uh, but the problem with going round by round is you're obviously right, by definition of the instruction, you're taking the input state, working on it, and writing the output state right back to the vector registers. And when you write the outputs, after just one round, you write the output state, the register creates a huge uh, side channel leak. Uh, and so it's effectively impossible to provide side channel protection if your instruction is defined that way. So the, with the AS instruction, then we, we're going to do all the rounds, all 10 or all 14 rounds with one opcode. And that gives the implementer the flexibility to hide all the internal states all the way from the beginning to the end of the instruction. They only have to you know, start with the plain text and go through all the rounds and just write the cipher text out. Uh, and so uh, that doesn't create the, that leak if, if the implementation is masked, for instance. So it's up to the implementer to uh, decide what kind of protections they have, what kind of claims they're going to make about those protections. We're just creating an instruction that gives them the freedom to do that. Okay, so some you know, possible kind of uses for you know, this vector high-speed AES uh, would be you know high-speed data communications like TLS uh, or uh, disk disk encryption like uh, XTS mode, uh, for example. Okay. Okay. So, kind of already covered this. Um, so the key management keys are keys are stored in the hardware. They're, they're uh, uh, presented, returned a handle from the hardware, and then. Um, there's a key encryption scheme we're calling RAP5, which is an authenticated encryption with additional data scheme. It's based on um, uh, AES GCM SIV mode. Uh, and it, it's designed to be able to inherently handle um, uh, key shares. So if you have like an AES key, it's a, a masked in, in, in multiple shares, uh, Boolean masking, uh, when you unwrap the key uh, from from this wrap five blob, uh, it generates shares. It doesn't generate the plain text key. It generates key already split into into shares, and so it can feed. And again, that's in the hardware. You know, it's not visible to software. Uh, it just gets you just get a handle back. And so let's say you're storing your AES key in three shares. There'll be an internal hardware register that has 768 bits, for example, and then uh, a handle will come back, and when you call the AS instruction, you use the handle, and it'll grab those three shares. And you know, if the AS implementation is also masked, then it could you know just keep the mask all the way through the entire operation. So you you have the capability to to design a uh, side channel resistant uh, instruction. Okay, and then. Um, Full rounds, again, I'm kind of repeating myself a bit here. This is just saying that uh, uh, the AS instruction uses a handle, not, uh, and, you know, gets the key out of this internal hidden register. Uh, and it, it doesn't require, but at least facilitates being able to make a hardened implementation. So people may use the full rounds instruction because they want to do more pipelining and they want more performance, and they don't care about masking. Uh, but another user may be just the opposite. They might, they might mainly care about uh, side channel leakage, and so they could create a masked implementation. So that's up to the implementer, and what claims they make is up to them, and what proof they, they provide or assurances they provide that you know the leakage is good in their silicon. That's up to them. We're just, we're just creating the instruction set. Okay, and then uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Nicola. You got. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Um, so Richard already uh, told you a bit about one of our uh, ongoing uh, program, and I'm going to, to tell you a bit more about another one, which is the, the post-quantum cryptography task group. And uh, I wanted to start with our charter. So when uh, we create a task group, we basically have to submit a, a submission, and we have to, to tell to the, the security HC and, and the, the chair group what is going to be our, our mission. And so the, the mission that was uh, selected for the, the PQC task group is uh, we want to explore, recommend, and develop a RIS-5 ISA 
uh, and some extension for the, the contemporary uh, public key cryptography. So in our mission, we already uh, announced that we are going to try to create some new instructions to try to accelerate the cyberism. And we are uh, focusing right now on uh, a few uh, upcoming uh, draft standards for the, the PQC algorithm, uh, in particular uh, Kyber and, and Dilithium, but we are also open to, to considering others, and uh, obviously we, we try to, to follow wha what's going on there and uh, the, the evolution. Uh, one other of the, the building block for the task group is that we don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to build on what's already existing in RIS-5, and in particular the, the scalar and vector crypto extension that were uh, described previously by, by Richard. Um, and the last part of this slide is I represented the RIS-5 specification life cycle. So it's kind of a, a multi-stage process where we, we start by uh, an inception, making sure that we have something, planning and uh, submitting the plan to, to the community. And the current step of the, the post-quantum cryptography task group is actually the, the development. So what, what I'm going to, to present in the next couple of slides is uh, an ongoing work and uh, any feedback is, uh, is welcome. Uh, and uh, if you want, uh, please uh, join the task group. We have a, a mailing list and a, a weekly meeting uh, as well. Uh, once we will be done with this development, we are going to freeze the, the specification and then uh, go through the, the ratification process, which is a, a multi-stage review process with different uh, committee and subcommittee in RIS-5 uh, before finally uh, submitting the, the specification for the, the ratification by the, the board of directors. Uh, so let me uh, go into a bit more of the detail on uh, what, what we have been doing uh, before today for the, the task group, uh, and I'm going to present a work that was done mostly by our chair, uh, Marco. And uh, the goal of this work was, uh, it's really a, a computer architect job, it's let's find out uh, what's uh, RIS-5 performance for the, the post-quantum cryptography algorithm, and let's study the, the existing algorithm, let's study the Let's study the, the, the existing implementation and let's try to, to find the, the hot spot and what we could accelerate. So this work was done by, by looking at uh, Kyber and, and Dilithium and uh, it was done by uh, m measuring the, the, re the retire instruction and kind of using that as, as a proxy uh, for performance, which could be debated uh, the, the quality of that metric, but it, it's still quite uh, some interesting insights. And what we wanted to do in that work is uh, we wanted to uh, isolate for each of the high level uh, function uh, involved into the, the post-quantum cryptography primitives uh, or was the, the instruction, uh, the retire instruction split between uh, all of them. And uh, so uh, you can see that in the, the, the pie chart that I have represented here. And there is nothing really new uh, here it's mostly uh, we are doing uh, and we are doing what everyone else is doing and we are slow where uh, everyone else is slow. So uh, for example, the, the Ketchak primitive to, to expand the, the, the matrices used in, in PQC, the modulo arithmetic and the, the entity. So uh, with this work, we just um, validated the initial uh, hypothesis uh, that was uh, we will need to accelerate Ketchak, we will need to accelerate modular arithmetic, and we need to accelerate entity. Uh, and basically, what we had before that, uh, in terms of uh, RIS-5 extension, I is not enough. Uh, so we tried using the, the current RIS-5 vector uh, extension, and also the vector crypto, and we found out that the, the acceleration in front of uh, a pure scalar implementation was not really uh, that useful, and that uh, we will need uh, another set of, of proposal to, to get to uh, an acceptable level of performance for, for those primitive. And uh, same thing for the, the modular arithmetic. So what the task group is currently exploring is uh, what can we do to accelerate Ketchak and to accelerate Entity. And uh, so this is a RIS-5 task group, so we are suggesting a new and dedicated instruction and we are uh, currently considering dedicated RIS-5 instruction to implement Ketchak. So it's basically doing the, the SHA-3 round with a, a single instruction or even uh, fusing a few rounds in one instruction and trying to, to leverage the, the size of the, the vector uh, register file that uh, the RIS-5 vector is 
is offering to uh, store the, the 1600-bit state in, into the, the vector registers and uh, operate on that uh, with a, a single instruction. And same thing for the, um, the modulo arithmetic. Uh, we are uh, basing ourselves on the assumption that the modulo used in PQC will be uh, fixed and shortlist, and we are kind of hoping that they are not going to change too much. And we are suggesting to uh, harden modulo arithmetic with those uh, Kyber or Debian specific modulo and, um, and use that to uh, accelerate by a factor of uh, between five and 10 the, the way we can do modulo arithmetic, which in turn can uh, accelerate the, the entity, so the, the number theoretic transform used for the, the polynomial multiplication, which is the, the basis of, of those algorithm. So this is pretty much an, uh, an ongoing work. Uh, we, so as I said, it's more or less a computer architect uh, job, but we are also very much interested into the, the feedback from, from the community. So it can be the, the implementers, uh, it can be the, the end users, it can be the, the cryptographer as well. So everyone is welcome to, to participate to, to this effort. Uh, so we are sharing the, the meeting with the I assurance cryptography. We have a weekly meeting and we have a, a mailing list we, which is open. And I'm going to uh, switch to Grant. Oh. <laughs> okay, so we've heard about all the extensions with uh, crypto and risk five. so I can hopefully provide a bit of context about how these are used in, in reality. Um, so PQC would have probably in a, a pretty good position here to, to give you that context. We have been working with BIS-5 since um, 2018. Um, we also develop cryptography, IP. Um, so we're both a contributor to the standards and also a consumer of risk five. Um, as, as Rich uh, touched on, we've our team has been heavily involved in, uh, you know, authoring the, the, the scale extension, you know, the uh, ZKT constant extension, the entropy interface. A lot, a lot of this was contributed to significantly by by your team, and we also stay um, really in touch with things like uh, post quantum crypto. Obviously, is is exactly where we are um, working. Um, in, t in terms of implementation, Risk Five has always been a big thing for us. You know, the open open ISA, um, open source community providing CPUs means that we can easily, you know, utilize these cores off the shelf for things like you know testing, you know, and also looking at you know side channel protection, how we uh, implement our um, IPs and, and test them using Risk Five. So we do that both using uh, open source and uh, we have commercial partnerships in the Risk Five area as well that we're um, working with too. So in terms of use cases, um, I've got a couple of examples here of what we are doing in, in PQ Fuel to you know, give you a flavor of where these um, crypto extensions can be used. So if we consider platform security, so we're looking at you know, root of trust, uh, how we uh, ensure that we um, boot our platforms and you know, that's always used you know, cryptography at the core. Um, so here, you know, if you consider something like a, a secure enclave or a security subsystem, um, the main drivers along these, this type of um, use case is, is security and cost. So Risk V lends, it, lends itself really well to this particular type of use case. Um, you know, the cores are typically hidden from the, the user, so we can we can use a, a Risk V core in there easily. Open source cores are available that can be used. Uh, we use the Ibex core, which is a, a well-known op open source core, and we have extended that with the, the cryptography scalar extensions um, within this subsystem. So that allows us to do things like, you know, so we have the AES and SHA-2 extensions. It, it easily allows us to do things like DRBGs or key derivation functions. Um, we've used the SHA-2 extensions, for example, to accelerate LMS and XMSS signature verification, which if you're familiar with, um, post -quantum, these are post-quantum schemes as well, uh, becoming very popular uh, as we transition to post-quantum. So that complements itself very well, um, you know, providing a very lightweight solution for these types of uh, extensions. You know, the, the, the area overhead, the, um, the number of gates or silicon area required for, for these extensions is quite low, um, but allows us to implement things, um, better performance, um, reduces the, the code size within these types of implementations as well. And it gives you that flexibility. So here we, we have the, the post-quantum part offloaded into dedicated coprocessors, but we can have a lot of the, the classical crypto implemented within the Risk Five part using these extensions. Then on the other side, if, if you consider really high-end applications such as you know cloud security, we're referring to it here, but things that require throughput or performance, 
So looking at communications interface, network backbone, HSMs, for example. Typically, the, the type of customers we're talking to there are always asking you know, things in terms of you know, operations per second or throughput. Uh, so it's a very different use case to, um, to the platform security. So it's, it's all about performance. Uh, you know, an, an interesting uh, use case there is really you know, the, these vector instru in, uh, extension instructions that, are, you know, that have been spoken about previously. So there's the, the plain vector, but also the crypto uh, flavor. And then the upcoming post-quantum extensions are obviously really important. Now, these can really help to accelerate the, the bottlenecks within these different algorithms, you know, the, the different post-quantum lat lattice-based algorithms, the hash-based algorithms. And we're actively look, working with commercial partners to you know, port our software solutions onto you know, vector processors using the, the RISC-V vector extensions. It, it gives that flexibility um, and performance upgrade without you know, committing to a full hardware solution. Yeah. So for, for us at PQ Shield, it really it does give us that flexibility. Um, within RISC-V, we, we can choose, depending on the use case, depending on the customer, we can, we, we can use scalar crypto extensions, we can, we can go for a, a software accelerated solution using vectors. You know, so I think that's the big benefit that we see using these extensions. Okay. And back to Rich. Okay, thank you, Graham. Um, so we're going to kind of switch formats here. Let's see how much time we've got. About 15 minutes. Yeah, so uh, we're going to kind of switch to a more traditional panel format. Um, uh, the panelists will take questions. If you have a question, um, I guess that microphone there uh, can maybe be turned on or is turned on. Uh, and if you don't, I have some prepared questions and we can start with that while you, while you think about things. So um, uh, first question is kind of a compound, multi-sentence question, so pay attention. <laughs> so well, what are the pros and cons of using a crypto instruction set extension versus pure software or hardware root of trust implementations? Where do the RISC-V ISA extensions fit in in the grand scheme of on-chip crypto implementations? And do uh, ISA extensions displace other approaches? Okay. So it looks like uh, Andrew's <laughs> gonna take a crack at that. So, yeah. <laughs> that was a compound question, wasn't it? Um, so I think there are three options, really, when you implement crypto in, in modern systems. There's pure software, there's cryptographic extensions in the ISA, and then there's a hardware accelerator. Um, the cryptographic ex extension sits somewhere in the middle. So software, pure software solution, obviously you're, you, you've got flexibility, you can implement any new standard you like, um, but you pay the, the cost of code size, performance, um, power consumption, efficiency, um, all of these things, as well as some of the more subtle things you might not think of, like attack surface, so a, a crypto library might have bugs in it, um, if you've got lots of code performing your crypto operations, um, and security, so you may not be able to properly mask things or protect things if it's done purely in software. So a crypto extension goes some way to um, alleviating the disadvantages of software. It lets you have um, a more portable, more adapt, more easily um, shared code across different implementations. Um, each, each, uh, each library can just make the same call to a, a single ISA instruction, and you know by definition it's going to perform the operation you want. Um, it doesn't have all the advantages um, of a full hardware implementation. Um, Full hardware implementations give you better isolation, better security, probably better performance again because you can have very high speed dedicated machines. But it, does, um, it doesn't come at the same cost. So it's kind of the sweet spot. An extension is really the sweet spot, sweet spot between software portability um, versus hardware costs is how I would see it. I guess just to add to that, I mean, I think it just, it's about flexibility, right? You know, I don't think, think it's ever going to dis completely displace, you know, having dedicated co-processors, but, you know, the, these type of instruction extensions exist in, you know, ARM or Intel CPUs, and we have a, a variety of, you know, many different implementations of, of crypto subsystems and accelerators within those, those ecosystems as well. So I think, for me, it's, it's about flexibility for a, a, you know, a system architect or a security architect to choose based on their use case what, what, what's the best fit. Right? You know, so having these extensions you know, allows you to tune things a little bit better. You, know, you can have quite lightweight um, solutions that you know, just gives you a bit more benefit at little cost. You know, 
or you can really accelerate things or you know and the, then these upcoming instructions are things like you know for high assurances you know, you know giving you an, an alternative to doing things in a, a, a focused secure enclave so for me just flexibility is the big benefit here I can maybe just uh, add a, a, a last word is that, yeah, I think it's, it's, a, it's a good benefit for the implementer as well because it can uh, inherit from the, the ecosystem software and uh, still offer a solution that's better than pure software. And also with RISC-5 and RISC-5 vector, uh, we have made sure to suggest something that was scalable as well. So you can implement uh, the same instruction set with different uh, performance targets, depending on your vector width, and that's something that's uh, very tied to the fact that we have a shared uh, ISA, so. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, gentlemen. There's a question from the floor. Yeah, uh, can you use the microphone, please? Uh, thanks for the um, uh, beneficial uh, talk. Just I have uh, one question or two maximum. Um, the first one, do you think we will see like a lightweight crypto algorithm from um, post-quantum? Um, because now we know the, the lithium and Kyber and, uh, and others. Uh, the first question. The second qu question is related to the um, risk five or ARM and FPGA. What's the pros and cons between these two from a uh, security perspective? Do you want, I'm, I'm going to take the PQC and I'm going to leave one of you and answer the, the FPJ. Uh, so in terms of uh, algorithm for, for PQC, uh, my presentation was focused on Kyber and Delithium, but uh, we are looking at everything that's out there. And um, so we, we are trying to, to prioritize and we have prioritized by looking at Kyber and Delithium because we think NIST is going to standardize them shortly. At least we were expecting that uh, a few months ago. Um, but uh, yeah, we are also looking at other algorithm. And uh, if you look at RIS-5 in general, uh, in particular in the, the vector extension and the vector crypto extension, we have been adding uh, new instruction at every uh, stage to accelerate crypto in, in general. So there are some algorithm that we know can benefit from very specific uh, instruction, but some algorithm where uh, they can benefit from uh, much more generic instruction. So we have a vector bit manipulation, which is uh, useful across a lot of uh, cryptography primitive. So this is how we are trying to address more than the, the two algorithms uh, I talked about uh, during the, the presentation. Uh, who wants to handle the, the FPGA versus yes. ARM and uh, RIS-5? Yes. We have another question. Yeah, I mean, well? uh, my understanding of the question was what the relative merits or benefits of ARM versus RISC-V versus FPGA, did you say? Is that? From a security perspective. From a security perspective, okay. Um, so I'll, I'll take some and then I'll give uh, Graham a go. Um, so from my perspective, um, it's the clean sheet nature of RISC-V that, that lets you build something where in theory we, we shouldn't be making the same mistakes that people have made in the past. Um, we haven't got massive complexity of legacy so having to be backwards compatible with you know, huge amounts of complex previous generations of instruction set, um, different op operating modes, different levels of um, compatibility across previous implementations, all of these things add attack surface and therefore are bad for security. Risk five, we can, we can start from a, a nice, very simple, very really is a reduced instruction set architecture. So you look at the number of instructions of Risk five and you look at the number of instructions of ARM and there's an order of magnitude difference. Now, they're performance equivalent now. I mean, this, is, this has been proved by some of the really big guys um, you know, releasing products. Um, for instance, Qualcomm's recent wearable, um, fully integrated SOC running a, an application processor based on RISC-V. It's, there's performance parity, but there's not complexity parity. So for me, RISC-V has a huge benefit in terms of genuinely clean sheet um, new look at security, so we can build things in from the get-go. And secondly, we haven't got that layers and layers and layers of years of legacy and complexity that, that increases the attack surfaces. Um, and also, we're, we're, you know, to, to, to coin the phrase, we're standing on the shoulders of giants, right? We're, we're, we're aware of Spectre, we're aware of these, these attacks that we should have been aware of, because they were blindingly obvious with hindsight, but none of us saw it. But um, you know, we, we, are, we, we can now take these into, into account and build into our ISA the 
protections and the mechanisms up front. Things like Cherry, for instance, you know, capabilities is coming. Um, whether it's Cherry or whether it's something else, but capability hardware is, is, is revolutionary, or at least has the potential to be revolutionary in preventing something like 70 or 80% of, of software bugs due to memory safety. But I guess just the comment on the, the risk five versus ARM, I mean, there's been a big uptick, I mean, a real big desire in the, the you know, SOC community to, you know, um, you know move out of, from being overly reliant on ARM. You know, it's like, and, and, you know, engineers can really see the benefit in risk five in that they have you know, the open source eyes that they have control over it. You can get open source versions of cores to be used, you know, allows them control over the, the whole ecosystem and the security of it, all, all these type of things. So, uh, and as, as Andrew mentioned, the, the performance is, is equivalent there. There's, there's open source versions. There's very, there's many commercial vendors of CPUs now that you, you have equivalent performance and security level of the um, system level security implementations such as you know, PMPs and all these type of things are, are there in RISC-V as well. So I think it's having that alternative to, to the incumbents, a, a big driver here. Um, and you know they both can be implemented in FPGA. It's, uh, I don't think there's any real big differentiation there. Any other question? So this may be our last question. Yeah. Uh, I will just uh, <laughs> build a bit on the first question that, that was discussed before about the post quantum implementations, uh, because the post quantum solutions are a bit fragile, meaning that we may have an issue with some of them, it was quite close recently, actually. Uh, I was wondering, for instance, when there is some kind of other solution like, uh, which is based on the same principles like Frodochem, which is lattice-based like Kyber, um, does the instruction set, which is foreseen to be implemented in risk five can potentially make easy Frodochem, as an example, to also be implemented in the future, or does it require completely new development? Thank you. Uh, it's, it's a very good question. Yeah, we, we have been frightened lately about the, the PQC. Um, so this, we are trying to, to keep our eyes open and to make sure that we can, so we want to implement an instruction set extension and it should be as generic as we can. So we are trying to, to cover all bases. Um, it's always a compromise between performance and flexibility. So I spoke about the, the modulo arithmetic that we are trying to harden. Uh, that's sure that if we have a different modulo that, that uh, appear after we have ratified, we will need to add an, a new extension to do that. But everything we are looking at to make sure that we can support a generic entity efficiently or that we can do uh, SHA-3 efficiently will be helpful for a lot more algorithm than just uh, Kyber and Delicium. So yeah, we are trying to cover all our bases, but uh, it's, it's always a compromise between the two. And uh, yeah, um, if we can specify very generic instruction, we will try to find them and uh, we will try to uh, uh, specify them. But sometimes we are selecting very specific implementation, uh, very specific specification, which may not be that helpful if the algorithm space move too much. And that's why we are certainly going to wait for the, the ratification by NIST before ratifying our own uh, extension. We want to be ready, but we will wait for the, the last minute before uh, actually uh, setting that in stone and uh, freezing everything. Thank you. Thank you, Graham. I guess just, just on the PQC, it's what, and one of the, the benefits of the, the ISA extensions is it's really you're accelerating only some core parts of the algorithm. You know, it's not the entire thing. So, you know, if you know, something has to change in the algorithm, you know, it's, it's, it can be updated relatively easily versus you know a full hardware solution. Um, obviously, requires more time to do that. So I think until we get these standards, things things the goalposts can move. But I think having a you know kind of halfway flexible house here, and, and it's, it's software, but with a level of acceleration really, you know, benefits from that, so I think it's still a, a good approach. Okay, uh, I'm gonna give the last question, because uh, I think it'll be short, we're just about out of time. So, uh, what level of adoption is expected in commercial or open source crypto libraries? What is the ecosystem tool chain support for the risk five crypto extensions? Anybody? 
I'll take a quick stab at it. So uh, when we ratify uh, uh, an extortion, in particular that was the case for the vector crypto, one of the goal is uh, to get a proof of concept running in an uh, open source library somewhere. So for example, the vector crypto extension, there have been an effort to integrate that into OpenSSL and also into the, the Linux kernel crypto layers. And so it's definitely something that the community is looking into and we are making sure that uh, we have a proof of concept in an existing library that's open source and that's uh, used by uh, widely in the, the public. Thank you. Anyone else? That's it, we're out of time. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.